right, we're going to do um, video here on 9.2, and apologize again, no video this time, no webcam, and uh, not so great audio. All I had was my earbuds with the mic, like for your phone, so audio quality is not going to be great. Um, all right, so next section here, we're going to talk about the population mean. We've done confidence intervals about the population proportion, and now we're going to have to introduce some new theory here. You can see on the list there, we have something called a T distribution. And then we're going to do these confidence intervals for the mean and, again, find a necessary sample size. So let's go back to the confidence intervals about a population proportion. We had this point estimate, which would be our sample proportion. That's our best guess. And then we did this 95%, which is about um, plus two standard deviations each way. And that's the margin of error for our confidence interval. And then we get this p hat plus or minus the margin of error. Or to be more precise, you have your point estimate plus or minus this z alpha over 2. And that's your margin of error. And the, the sigma p hat is the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat all over n. And that's actually a, an approximation for it. So, what if we want to now kind of extend this idea and do a confidence interval about the population mean, mu? So, we have this point estimate for the proportion, plus or minus that number of standard deviations each way. And so, what if we just kind of swap that out and do an x bar? And instead of a sigma p hat, it's a sigma x bar. It's the same idea, your point estimate in the middle. We know we have these conditions where x bar can be normally distributed, so we could use all of the same reasoning, and we could end up with the same thing, x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 times sigma x bar. And we know what sigma x bar is if the sample size is greater than or equal to 30 with no outliers, and x is, or x is normally distributed. Um, and so we can get a confidence interval for the population mean, which is x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2, times sigma over square root of n. The, there's a big problem with this, though. You have to look at this formula, and it has this x bar, so your sample mean, plus or minus a z, and then it, it has the population standard deviation in the formula, which is a confidence interval for the population mean. So the implication here is you don't know the population mean, and you're finding a confidence interval for it. But the formula uses the standard deviation. So how often would you not know the population mean, but you would know the population standard deviation? I mean, we might have a couple of homework questions about this in theory, but really that's not going to happen. So that sigma in there is an issue. Now the obvious replacer for that is to put s, but then things kind of change a little bit there, and the distribution gets a little bit different. So we're going to introduce a new distribution, very similar to a z, which was x minus mu over sigma. We're going to call this a t, x minus mu over s. It's actually called student's t distribution, which sounds crazy, but the guy who wrote it um, was working for a brewing company, and he was doing some analysis on the distribution of, I don't remember what it was he wasn't analyzing, I don't know if I've ever... If, they know, if I know the specifics, but he published this paper, and because he was working for the company, um, he couldn't publish it under his real name because he wasn't allowed to share his research, so he published it under the name of student. And now suddenly, uh, this is called forever student's T distribution. All right, so it's very similar to a Z. You'll notice it has the student's T distribution with this so-called N minus 1 degrees of freedom. Now, you might recall the N minus 1. Uh, the n minus 1 is very similar to what's in the standard deviation formula for s. Uh, and the degrees of freedom is essentially saying, like, suppose I have 10 students in my class and I have 10 lollipops I'm going to give. The first student has 10 things to choose from. The second student has 9 to choose from, third student, etc. And when I get down to the last student, there's no choice. So only 9 students had some freedom to choose there, the tenth one did not. So I'm kind of waving my hands at it and being a little casual, but that's basically that has to do with that n minus 1 degrees of freedom, and that's going to play a role here as we progress what that degrees of freedom means. So you'll notice here the big difference is that the denominator for a z is sigma, the denominator for a t is s. And so because S 
varies. It's not as consistent. Like sigma is what it is, right? Where S can vary based on the sample. So the T distribution looks very similar to a normal distribution. Um, but it's a little more uncertainty, so it's more spread out. Uh, and I have a visualization here. Let me see if I can get it up. There it is. All right. So here I have the top one here is the normal distribution. Can I zoom in? No, oh, no. Can't really, can you? All right, so the top one is the normal distribution. The bottom one is the T. And what's interesting is as my degrees of freedom increase, the T essentially becomes the Z. What this means is if we go back to our slide here, back at the previous one, T is X minus mu over S. Well, if I have a sample size of 1,000, just throwing that out there, the standard deviation of the sample is going to be really, really close to the standard deviation of the population. And so the difference with the Z and T is going to be negligible. If I have a sample size of 2, which is just a couple of people, boy, that standard deviation could really vary. And so there's a lot more uncertainty in this T with a small sample size. So very similar to the normal. It's symmetric, um, but it has a little more uncertainty. And so um, it's going to add some uncertainty into our confidence intervals and make them a little bit wider to get the same degree of confidence. Um, throwing in the tables here just so you have exposure to it. Um, the tables, because you're always... The only time you're looking at T is for confidence intervals or in the next chapter where we're looking for just these critical ones with certain area to the right. Um, that's all the table has is it has the degrees of freedom, the area to the right, and then the particular T score in that table. Um, we're going to use StatCrunch, and so there's a T calculator very uh, similar to the normal calculator, except it has the degrees of freedom. So instead of a, mi, a, a mu and a sigma, the mean and standard deviation, it's just the degrees of freedom that changes the probability in the shape here. So if we, we said just a few slides ago that if we knew sigma, we have this uh, confidence interval x bar plus or minus z alpha over 2 times sigma over square root of n. Going to copy that down here again. But if sigma is unknown, all we're going to do is just kind of look at that z and sigma and swap them out for a T and an S. Uh, and that T alpha over 2 has n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So very similar to the P hat plus or minus the Z times the standard deviation, except now with this uncertainty, instead of Z times the standard deviation of X bar, we're introducing S and then calling it a T. We're going to use StatCrunch for all this, but it's important to understand where this is coming from. So in StatCrunch, uh, it's under the stats, T stats in one sample with, with summary or with data, depending on what you have. Uh, and then you get this output, and we'll talk more about it on the next page. All right, so suppose we'd like to know how many hours per week hybrid students uh, at ECC work. So let's suppose we have a sample of 35 students. We find a mean of 14.3 hours. Uh, the standard deviation of 5.4 hours. We want to construct a 95% confidence interval for the average hours worked per week of all hybrid students. So we've got this sample size of 35. The sample mean is 14.3. And the, it's not, it doesn't clearly state here, but look, if we take a sample and find this with this standard deviation, this is clearly the sample standard deviation. It's clearly S, not sigma. We're going to construct a 95% confidence interval. So let me move back over to here. So we'll do stat. Where was it? TSATs, one sample with summary. The mean was 14.3. Oh, uh, Standard deviation. Oh, I got to remember this stuff. 5.4. Sample size was 35. I remember that. Confidence interval. Did we want 95? Yep, 95. And hit compute. And here we go. And I actually already had that screenshot done. So let's talk about what these things mean here. The standard error, sometimes people confuse that with the standard deviation. That actually is the standard deviation of the sample mean. That's sigma x bar. 
And so that's about 0.91. It's not relevant here in our discussion, but that's the standard error that's computed here. The degrees of freedom, df, that's n minus 1, so 35 minus 1. And then you have your lower limit, which will round just like the mean was to one place more than the data. So the mean was 14.3, we'll round to 12.4. And then the upper limit, we'd round to 16.2. So we can be 95% confident that the mean hours work per week uh, is between 12.4 and 16.2 hours. Oops, I kind of put in per week there twice, but oh well. <laughs> so let's try another one here. Uh, we're going to use some data this time. We got this ACT and COMPASS data. We're going to try to find a 95% confidence interval for the average ACT math subscore for new incoming students. So I've got it over here, ACT and COMPASS. And so we have ACT math score. I, I don't know if you remember the background here. This is a sample of 100 um, new recent high school graduates. Um, I, I had the full data set of, gosh, I don't remember how many thousands of students it was. And then this was just a random sample of 100 of them. So we're going to do stat, T stats, one sample, but now I have the data. So with data. And we want to do columns, ACT math. We want a 95% confidence interval again, and then we'll hit compute. And so the sample mean was 18.4, and with a degree of freedom pretty high here, a large sample size, we're pretty confident that it's between 17.9 and 18.9, so a pretty narrow confidence interval there. Um, because the sample size is so large. So we can be, well, the mean, sample mean is 18.4, and with a sample size of 100, we're pretty sure that we're plus or minus, what would that be, 0.5. So we're pretty 95% confident that the average ACT math subscore is between those two. All right, last thing we want to talk about is this sample size necessary. So um, we got this confidence interval. And if we look at the last part there, that's the margin of error. And so if we solve that for n, you can do a little algebra here, multiply by the square root of n on both sides, and then divide by e, and then square it. We get this t alpha over 2 times s all over e, and the whole thing is squared. Very similar to what we had for the sample size necessary for the population proportion. Now, the problem here is we're looking for the sample size necessary, so we don't know n, but t alpha over 2 has the degree of freedom. So like a lot of statistics, we're going to approximate it and say, well, let's just use z uh, and just say, you know what, we'll just approximate it with z. And so now we have this sample size necessary. And then there's an s in here. And you can say, well, how can I, if I'm trying to find a confidence interval from you and it, the formula uses s, but I haven't done my study yet, and then so I'm trying to figure out how many people I should survey, how do I get s? It's kind of like the p hat in the other formula where it's from a previous study or maybe a pilot study that you did, uh, something like that. So um, if we do an example here, I'm not going to do it by hand, but I have the w work already here. So let's say we want to find uh, the average hours spent working per week for all ECC students. And we want, it, we want our mean to be within three hours. Um, so we, we can't just ask five students, right, because we could be way off. So do I ask 100 students, 200 students, 50 students, how many do I need? So we're going to assume that based on a previous study, the standard deviation is about 11, excuse me, 11.5 hours. So here's the sample size necessary formula. For a 95% confidence interval, you might recognize this one. We did it before. That's 1.96. Uh, if you wanted to get that, you could just do the stat calculator normal. And Z, so 95% means that there's 5% in the tails. And so if I divide by 2, it would be 0 0.025, but I want to be, so Z 0 0.025. Z 0 0.025 is the Z with 0 0.025 area to the right. And so that's 1.96. Uh, and if I simplify that, I get 56.46. And you notice I rounded to 57. Now, we talked about this for the last section as well, that we always want to round up because we need at least 56.46. And honestly, with some of this other variability, like, well, we use Z instead of T, we use a prior estimate instead of S, you might even round this up more and say, you know what, for to be conservative, I'm going to take, you know, 65 or something like that just to be conservative.
Um, you never know, you might end up with a confidence interval error, margin of error, a little bit more than three because of these approximations that we're doing in here. But this will get us to about the right sample size necessary. So it saves us some time and money if we thought we needed 200, but actually no, you only need, you know, 60 some, 50 some. Okay, I think that is it. Yep, that's the last one for 9.2. Uh, and I'll put the link down below to all the relevant uh, information here.